Good evening, everybody. Today is Wednesday, June 21st. At least I hope it is anyway. That's the date that I have. We're beginning a new Bible study tonight. Maybe you're aware of that. Maybe you're joining with us new, you guys that have been with me for a while. Just be patient as I give, as I become just quickly a little redundant on some of the things I think that are important to know with our Bible study at Friendship Blessing and Church that we do online and in-house on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. So what is the new Bible study? You probably are aware of the book of Judges, broken people, but faithful God. Probably going to say this multiple times tonight, but uh, a number of disturbing stories in this book of the Bible. And uh, one of the reasons I want to tackle it is in recent days, I've had people who are digging in God's word questioning me about these stories in the book of Judges. So going to be very interesting. 10-week study, uh, total of 12 weeks. Two of the weeks we do not meet online or in-house. I'm, I'm going to be redundant about this also because I'm going to show you our website in just a few moments after we pray to get started. But our judges reading plan so begins this evening, introduct, introduction in Judges chapter 1 through 311. And then, uh, uh, July 12th, no Wednesday at all. We have vacation Bible school here. Uh, at the church on that evening, and then August 16, multiple reasons why I'll be on retreat that week, but we're not having either. So total of 12 weeks, but 10-week um, Bible study. Let's pray before we do anything else. Father, we come to you grateful this evening for your word, Father, and we've learned over our times together the treasures that we find in your word that we might have never expected. And Father, I pray that for those that are new joining with us, Father, that even tonight will uncover, you will help us by your spirit to uncover things in your word that teach us more about you, Father. We want to be like Jesus, to walk in his footsteps. So guide and direct us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I think I kind of shared with you already, yeah, I did, but Judges tonight, Judges, introduction and chapter 1, 1 through 311. Of course, we won't cover that whole text. If you know anything about my Bible studies, we rarely get to every verse. That doesn't happen. So a few times, but not much. The goal of our Wednesday night Bible study is to whet your appetite for us to encourage one another in the Word of God, whet your appetite for deeper digging. And so here's some Bible study tools, just a quick thought. Um, when I think of our Bible study tools, first of all, we have an introductory video on our Bible study on YouTube. The date is April 27th, 2022, and it's titled Introduction to Bible Study. So actually, I, I used to cover every detail uh, at every new Bible study. The first evening was all about our Bible study, translations of the Bible, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't do that so much anymore because I've got that video out there that you can watch. So please go back and watch that. You can actually go back and watch uh, uh, any of our videos that uh, we uh, we have Bible studies that we've done before. In particular, in particular, I might encourage you to go watch the Joshua Bible study that leads into, uh, that was another reason why I chose Judges, because two Bible studies ago, we did the book of Joshua, and it leads right into Judges. So this is our website. I wanted to give you a little heads up, because I'll be saying 
quite a bit that you can go to our website, check out our Wednesday evening Bible study. Of course, we've got vacation Bible school coming up, our pavilion that's being built. You can check all of that out. Um, but also, so you go to this drop down about Friendship Bosnian Church, go to ministries, you'll see the next drop down and at the bottom, Wednesday night Bible study. And our website is friendshipwesleyan.org. You can get there, friendshipwesleyan.com also. So you will see our judges reading plan, both in PDFs and JPEGs. I believe that's a picture. Actually, I wanted to mention too, here's a link on our website too. So if you go to YouTube and you can't find that introduction to Bible study, just go to our website, go to Wednesday evening and click on this how to study the Bible, YouTube, and there it is. I'm not going to let it begin for you, but uh, there is uh, uh, in, uh, how to study the Bible on YouTube. You can see our past reading plans if you want to go check those out. And here is our how we study the Bible uh, on Wednesday evenings. You can I'm going to show you in PowerPoint in a moment. Uh, you can actually pull up this worksheet and print it off or the sheet of explanation. Uh, is the Bible true? I think that's an awesome one. I've often said, I think some believers still need to be uh, converted to God's word. And what I mean by that is, how do you know that a lot of people will say they know that the Bible is God's word by faith? Yes, we have to have faith. But there's so much more to that scientific, archaeological, so much evidence above and beyond any other book in the world that it is God's word, uh, and that would be the Bible. So check out on our website uh, the Wednesday evening Bible study material. So I told you that I was going to show you that worksheet on uh, our PowerPoints, and I have it here, and then give you a little explanation. So what we say on Wednesday nights is our study involves observation, interpretation, application. Our goal is to get to application. How does the Bible, how does that text in particular apply to our lives? But we start with observation. So like in this case, Judges 1 through 3.11, I'm going to read that, and I'll write down observations. Just no study, no anything, just observing. Then interpretation, so I'll grab my Bible study tools. One of the best ones you can have is a uh, Bible that is a study Bible that gives, and mine is. I won't attempt to show, you, show it to you, but it's got footnotes and commentary and cross-reference text, and, and so much more. And I'll use those material to get interpretation, uh, and then out of that, I will write down application for my life. So real simple form of study. Now, remember, I constantly encourage you to know the Bible by genre. So uh, the first five books of the Bible, known as the books of the law, then we have the history books, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, New Testament, kind of a similar breakdown. You got the Gospels, church history, the letters, and then prophecy. And so I kind of have the Bible in my mind. I think it's a good thing to do by genre, and that helps me to keep the whole 66 books kind of in order. And so then you will know, and if you see so we're in a history book in the Old Testament. Here's the book of Judges. Now, uh, Exodus is also. So Exodus, if you did the Exodus Bible study with me, Exodus leads into Joshua. Joshua leads into Judges. So that's why I've made this journey of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, include history, but really are about the law in a lot of ways. And so your history in Exodus leads directly into Joshua and then into Judges. Now, so let's jump from that into understanding this whole 
thing about judges. I've used this timeline before, and you can understand much of Israel's history and Old Testament history and biblical history through the leaders. What I say is follow the leaders. And I don't right now mean individual names of leaders or leaders in particular, but those uh, categories in the Bible, in the Old Testament of leaders. So we can go back to Genesis and the patriarchs. So we have the patriarchs, Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob. And then if you did any of that with me in our Genesis study, then you'll know that there's some debate over the other patriarchs. So we have the early patriarchs, uh, the the exodus or Israel in Egypt, the exodus from that, uh, Moses, and then Joshua brings us into the promised land and we enter into the period of leaders called judges from that. Matter of fact, I'll circle that for you so you can see where it fits in the timeline. Sorry that some of this is really difficult to read. Um, but uh, then we'll move from that into the time of the kings. And so we got the patriarchs, we got the judges, we got the kings. And with that in mind, we have covered a lot of Old Testament history. So books of the Bible by genre, history of Israel through their leaders. So the author of if you did any of your introductory study, you'll find out the author of Judges is mostly unknown. Many believe that Samuel's involved in some ways. Judges has a pretty simple theme. We'll see it in the timelines. Hopefully some of you went to YouTube and watched the Bible Project timeline, which is really good. Um, this is the finished product. And so I'm going to zoom in in just a minute on the next screen, but I think I'll, because our introductory, I've kind of already mentioned this, but you'll find what I mentioned here in this top left corner about the journey into the book of Judges, history-wise, but just for the sake of showing you through a highlight here, this is the section that we will cover this evening. Uh, so Joshua chapters one through two, and the beginning of three, we're going to cover the first judge. So let me blow up. Now, what I'm going to do is crop out or, or cut out this piece, this piece, and this piece, and put them together on one page from the timeline so that you can see it. It actually makes it closer. Our Wednesday evening in-house, they have it printed, so it's a lot easier for them to see and in hand. So remember, Joshua leads them into the promised land. They were to obey the commands. They actually, we're going to see this shortly. They, The people promise to do what God wants them to do. So, um, and, and Judges is going to be the account, the book of Judges of Israel's. We've already seen them fail, right? If you walked with me through Genesis, Exodus, and Joshua, we've seen them fail time and again, but now they are going to enter into a serious period of time of total failure in obe uh, obedi uh, obedience to God. They disobey. And so uh, we enter into this period of time of judges. So, And you see the two little finger with quotes, meaning what you think about a judge is not what we're thinking here. We're thinking about military type leaders. So they're going to be the leaders of Israel. We're going to see some of you, like you think of a judge and you think of Samson and his power and might. We're going to see the empowerment of God's spirit. But God does not endorse the human choices that are made here. So you can see the incongruent sign of the does not equal and I've mentioned this once already, be warned, some of these stories right here in chapter one, we're going to right away get into some verbiage and stuff that's a little bit disturbing. We'll eventually be into some uh, stories that are very disturbing. Take note, Israel becomes Canaanite. 
They're going to become like the people around them. So that is significant. So let me zoom in now also in that timeline into where we are this evening. Um, Israel fa fails to drive out the Canaanites, Canaanites. Remember, God's command to them was to drive the people out from the land. Now, we'll go all the way back to Genesis and Abraham and all that. Originally, Abraham had entered into Canaan land, and we're not. I'm not going to go into all that, but um, that, that kind of answers that question. Is God sending Israel into this place where these people, it's already theirs, and they're stealing the land or whatever? You need to go back and do those other Bible studies. You'll be able to follow the history of that. So then the Israelites become like the Canaanites. There's moral corruption, including child sacrifice. Um, and the tribes of Israel be become uh, not unlike their neighbors. And we're going to uh, uh, mention at least our first judge this evening, Oth Othniel. I love Charles Swindoll's timeline. Uh, let me show it to you. I show these every once in a while. Does, you can find this on the internet. Does an awesome job of showing. And let me jump ahead real quick. The real theme in Judges, I think, while I think the theme in Judges is God's mercy and forgiveness and patience and that whole piece, really what we begin to see is the cycle of sin of God's people. Israel falls into sin and idolatry. idolatry. Israel is oppressed. They cry out to the Lord. God raises up a judge. Israel is delivered, serves the Lord. There's peace until the judge dies. And then this whole thing starts again. So God's patience and mercy, but the cycle of sin. So now in Charles Swindoll's timeline, you can see, and, and Wednesday nighters, that are in house will have this in hand, a paper copy. You guys that are online, hopefully you can go back and pause it and look at it and uh, uh, be able to see it like you like you want to. So the causes of failure, we're going to cover that tonight. But then uh, judges and and there's a few more. Well, we get them down here, but these are also cycles of sin. And then we finish it out with some of the worst stories, one in particular um, disturbing stories there is, if you can see over here to the side, and then Samuel is going to eventually bring us into the time of the monarchy or the kings. I wanted real quick to show you the list of judges that we have in the text. Some people include Samuel and or Eli into this list of judges. Uh, you should count 13 judges here. So depending on the list you find, um, there may be 15. But this is a fairly comprehensive list with all kinds of information for you that I'm not going to go into, including the math of the periods of rest and the length of time. Othniel, uh, the period of oppression is eight years, and then they, this one actually includes the oppressors, the tribes that are involved in the chapter verse references to each of the uh, um, the judges. And so you can, once again, hopefully you can go back and look that over and it gives you a so, so this isn't complicated. I know there's a lot of information, but if you go back and listen and watch, understand the Bible through genre, the history of Israel through categories of leaders, the patriarchs, the judges, the monarchs, the kings. Um, it sounds like a lot, but it actually kind of simplifies the whole thing. Understand a book of Judges through the cycle of sin and the list of judges that we have there. And then uh, a reminder, once again, where we are in this history. So J under Joshua's leadership, they go into Canaan, into the promised land. This is their conquest map, the southern campaign, the northern campaign, so on and so forth. Once again, we went over that in Joshua. Then they enter in and they uh, the land is divided for each of the tribes of Israel, 
Once again, we covered this in our past Bible studies. So go back and uh, if you're interested and check those out. We uh, we read in, Ju in Judges 2, 6. So I should have told you to have your Bible open already. So if you go to Ju Judges 2, 6, I think I can take our map down now. Um, then you what you read is, let me read it for you, uh, 2, 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. And so maybe that was a little precipitous. So even so we get the connection back to Joshua, the inheritance according to each tribe. Uh, Joshua dies and is buried in Joshua chapter 24. And so if you look at 1-1, one, one, of judges after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord. And what we're going to get here in chapters one through three, mostly of judges, is continued conquest of the land. And like the Swindoll timeline shows, an also explanation as to why these cycles of sin and this incredible failure of God's people happens and takes place. And kind of the big thing is Israel forgets God. So I'm kind of giving you the the, the answer to the question is, the and and I think the problem starts, uh, well, it started a long time ago, but we get in Joshua, we get this back and forth uh, between the uh, the people and Joshua, and. Um, their promise, this, this is pretty uh, profound as you read this. So this is back at the close of Joshua, just before he dies. And, and listen to this. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods which is what's going to happen to them now. He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. So what I want you to catch here is these people have been warned a long time ago. If you ever raised kids and you felt like you were telling them, tell them, and you told them they don't listen, here we go. Um, look and what and listen to their response. But the people said to Joshua, no. We will serve the Lord. And then it continues. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. So, when you read these disturbing stories in Joshua, this is one of the things I've said about the Old Testament, that pretty popular criticism that the God of the Old Testament is this angry, murderous, authoritarian uh, deity. Um, when you read the Old Testament in its context and you put it all together, you'll find out there's no truth to that at all, and that God was patient and merciful and it's interesting to me because that popular criticism really is more reflective of us, humanity in the Old Testament stories, not, not of, of God. So that's that's why I wanted to connect to that. So let's get to some disturbing uh, stuff right away. So grab your Bibles again. Um, I'm not going to read this. This is so they begin once again to tell about the conquest after chap, uh, after verse one. Uh, uh, so Joshua, after the death of Joshua, Israel asked, who is to go up against, fight against the Canaanites? The Lord says Judah. And we, we begin to get this. So if you look at verse uh, six, so Judah attacks, right? And the Lord gives, verse four, and the Lord gave the Canaanites, parasites into their hands. Verse 5, it was there that they found Adonai Bezek and fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanite parasites. parasites. Verse 6, Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. 
Then Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. So Judah chases this king, this leader down and cuts off his thumbs and big toes. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but seems a, a little disturbing, right, to mutilate somebody. Um, so here's what I would say in not digging into all of this. We'll dig into other stories deeper later. But remember, this is after the fall. I've said everything after the fall is God dealing with messed up, sinful, broken people, right? And so, and now we're in the midst of some of some serious digression from obeying God, God's people. I think as we came into Judges, I mentioned to you last week, and I think in our in-house, Judges probably is a record of one of the most disturbing, ungodly times in the course of human history. Not that we're not in one now, and there aren't others. But when it comes to biblical history, even human history, now we're in the pit of since the fall, one of the worst periods of times, including with God's people. Here's what's interesting, that cutting off, so let me add some history to that, cutting off thumbs and toes was actually a common practice in that day. Adonai Bezek, that's actually what he's saying, is that he had done it to other kings, now it's been done to him. And it actually, in some ways, listen to this, you'll find this interesting. At that time, was kind of an act of mercy. And the reason why, because it was a way to allow these leaders to live. Um, and, and yet, so it allowed them to live, but uh, they couldn't serve militarily anymore because with their disabilities now, they were no good for military service. So in some ways, it was an act of mercy. So just some interesting stuff around that story. I think the key to understanding Israel's decline that we get in Judges, uh, we've got to jump over to verse 27. There's things you can read in between. But if you jump over to verse 27, uh, and we're getting further record of the conquest and what took place and happened, let me read some of it for you. And there's a, there's a common phrase here that's going to help you understand what's going on with these people. But Manasseh, verse 27, did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Tanakh. Jump down to verse 28. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Remember what they were supposed to drive them out, right? Uh, living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continue to live there among them. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites, verse 31, nor did Asher drive out those living in Echo and Sidon. And then if you jump down to verse 22, they did not, uh, sec the end of verse 22, verse 33, they did not drive them out, neither did Nephtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh. Common phrase, didn't drive them out, which is what God had uh, told uh, uh, told them to do, right? So um, this got me to thinking about an application here. So diso they're disobeying God. They're not driving out the, the, the people. Um, and so here's the application I was thinking of. If there are things in our lives that God has told us to drive out, to get rid of, and you don't. Um, we'll just do it because constantly in God's word and in the Bible, we're seeing this where God has a life for us and we disobey him on that. It doesn't work well for us. It, it doesn't work to disobey God. As a matter of fact, look what happens to Israel when they don't. So now go to chapter 2, and let's pick it up at verse 6. Okay, that's the one I referred to already, verse 6. 
uh, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. Uh, uh, let me see here. The people served the Lord throughout the uh, lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. So here in chapter 2, we're getting a recount, a recounting of what happened with Joshua. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Now listen to verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up. Who neither, uh, who knew neither the Lord nor what He had done for Israel. And I want to pause there. I think maybe. Let me see. I have that verse. Let's see. Yeah, I have that verse. After that whole, this is this is so profound to me. This verse. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done. And I'm going to say this because I'm assuming that the previous generation had not passed on. Uh, remember in the Old Testament, they're commanded to write it on their doorposts, to tell it to their children and to remember something happened here. And so it makes me wonder, is that the generation we now have? Are we living in a generation um, after the spiritual inheritance that we've received uh, in America, in our nation, in our communities, and now we're living in a generation that neither knows the Lord or what he has done for us. One of the most important tasks we have is passing on the gospel to the next generation. And I don't just mean parents. You say that we think of parents. If you're a believer, you're living for Jesus and are being salt and light so that the next generation knows. And so there, we, we got another application from the text here from this profound verse. So now let me go back to verse 11. I want to read some more. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. And that goes with verse 10, right? That's the result of not passing on the gospel. In, in, in their case, the story of Israel and what God had done for them. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around uh, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he'd sworn to them. They were in great distress. Now we get the introduction of the judges. Now you can find out how judges ended up in here through God's mercy. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. So now you can see the cycle that enters in to what is happening, okay? Now, rather than read the rest of it, I just want to kind of land this airplane this evening with you by um, pointing out a couple of things in this text through verse 23. So I'm not, I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to read some of what we didn't read yet so that you'll get an idea. So we get this. They're not listening. Judges are going to be raised up to bring them through these periods of times of distress, and uh, and we're going to get this uh, cycle of sin and brokenness. Then in verse 20, uh, read uh, look at verse 20 with me. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant, I ordain for their ancestors and has not listened to me. That's important, this whole covenant thing we discussed uh, back in our Old Testament studies 
and the uh, the covenants that God made without expectation, then the ones that the people made with God, and the the uh, covenant with Moses, the Mosaic covenant in particular, and and with Joshua, we read it too, where the people said, "We will obey," and Joshua said, "If you don't, that's the covenant they're breaking." with God. Verse 21, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them, the people that God doesn't drive out, to test Israel, see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. Now jump down to chapter 3, verse 1. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. And then further down, verse 4, they were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's command. So when we were first talking about this, that they hadn't driven out the people, it sounded like it's on Israel, but now it sounds like it's on God to test them. Well, for time's sake, I'm just simply going to say, first of all, uh, Israel is responsible. They didn't obey. They didn't drive the people out. They were beginning to act like the people in wickedness and and evil. But it brings up this whole idea, those, those verses with the word test. I checked through other translations. It's largely used. If the word test isn't used, then the word prove, that, that the God left these people to prove Israel. So the this whole idea of God testing people, it raises that quick question, well, didn't God know what the people were going to do anyway? And the answer to that question is, of course, God knew that, and God knows that. One commentator I read claimed that the word test more closely uh, uh, is related to our word train. So God knew what was going to happen. He wasn't testing them in that sense. He was training them. And actually, in the text, with military prowess and stuff, there is some idea of this, that these people that were left there would help to train them. But what I would say is that, um, and, and one commentary I read put this really well, that it isn't that when it comes to testing us or to testing the people in Israel in this case, it's not that God's ignorant of what they're going to do. Let me read it for you. Not that the Lord was ignorant of what they would do and so made the experiment and the people were the lab rats, right? But that the sincerity of faithfulness or insincerity and unfaithfulness of their hearts might appear to themselves and others. I've said this about like God asking questions in the Bible, like doesn't God know the answer? He does. We're the ones that need to hear the answer. And it's the same idea with this testing. It isn't so much for God as it is for us and for those around us. So then the second thing I want to say in context to what's going on in the book of Judges. So, and it isn't, it isn't, I think it is in this whole idea of testing, where now we, uh, we've we got God, these are the nations the Lord left to test. They were left to test the Israelites. Um, is this, the I think, deeply related here now what's happening in the, in the history of Israel, God's people, the book of Judges, that we can relate to, is that God is giving, we're in the stage where God is giving them over. He's giving these people what they want. So God tries to teach us and fight back, but there's, there's this concept or idea in both the Old Testament and the New, I'll show you in just a moment, where God gives us over. And so the, they didn't drive the people out. They're acting like the people in wickedness and evil. And now God's going to begin to allow them to reap. Sow what you reap, right? He's going to allow them to. And, you know, I thought of this as a parent, especially as you, you teach and train kids and you transition them in those adult stages to go from adolescence into adulthood, where the kind of discipline and stuff you give to them, you can't. It's different. Can't use the same anymore. And you keep saying don't about things they're doing that might be harmful to them or whatever. Uh, but the only way they're going to learn is to experience it themselves, right? 
Um, and God is like a parent with us. And so there's a couple of scripture texts that give this support. The first one is from Psalm 81 and actually specifically speaks into this period of history in Israel. I think to the whole history of Israel, but this moment in the book of Judges where I can say, hey, one of the things that God's doing is giving them over to what they want. They want the evil and stuff of these people they're living with. And so God's going to give them over. But Psalm 81, 11 to 14. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. Now, listen to the heart of God here. When I say God in the Old Testament, like maybe even that seems harsh to you, although I think it's a good testing training, even our, as all of us had to go through these things where we were told or and we didn't listen, and then you experience, right? And you're going to reap some of the harsh benefits, too, of not listening. Listen to the mercy in this second part of this psalm text. If my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their, subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. You really get a sense for the heart of God there. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, um, multiple times speaks of this, and I didn't underline it in this third one. I should have, but therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. So God gave them over to a depraved mind. So there's this constant theme in the Bible that um, if we insist on disobedience, insist on doing wrong, if we insist on being evil, then God will eventually allows us to reap the benefits of that desire and longing. And once again, it kind of raises the question of, are we in one of those places? Um, it would be really cool, like if it's that cycle and we come to repentance, because that's what I say. The only thing that can save us now um, uh, as a people is repentance and revival. I believe in it, and we need to pray for it, but we need a turning to God. And one of the reasons why I say that and preach that and teach that is because it's right here, God's word. Uh, God relented when people turn to him. So that takes me back once again to that Swindoll timeline that so well points out to us the constant cycles of uh, uh, God's mercy. Because what I want to do here in landing this airplane airplane is reassure you that our journey in Judges and all of the Old Testament history um, finds no evidence of that popular skepticism about the Old Testament and an angry God who just wants to kill people for no reason at all and, and is out. Um, I want to reassure you that Judges in the Old Testament proves God love God's love and mercy and patience. And when you look at this timeline, you surely you're convinced like me of God's patience as time and again, uh, this is going to happen and we're going to see this. I've often said when you read the Old Testament, you'll blush for the times that, that we as human beings, an end there, uh, would have been just punishment for our uh, uh, incredible evil and wickedness, and yet God is merciful. Many of you heard my sermon on Sunday, Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Um, you can see the flood as an angry God who just was mean to people, or you can look at that story and go, wow, what mercy and patience, and God saved us, and we're here breathing today, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then the New Testament text I was reminded of, the Lord isn't slow about keeping his promises as some think he is. In fact, God is patient because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. 
And guess what? Guess what happened to me in my study tonight? I didn't get to Othniel. You can read that. Um, chapter 3, verse 7, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushnan, Rishathim, king of Aram, Ner Ner Nehraim, to whom the Israelites were subjected for eight years. You look back on the timeline, as we'll see the eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz. And so uh, you there you go, the introduction to the uh, first uh, judge, and then we're going to cover the rest of the stories. So thanks for joining with me. I want to pose this in a word of prayer. Don't leave right afterwards, though. I'll give you that slide of our next text for next week. Father, thank you for your mercy and your patience and your love, not wanting any of us to perish, but all of us to come to repentance. And for your word, we give you thanks. Father, that reassures us of that even in these very disturbing stories, Father, uh, we're trying to imagine your heart in love and mercy to see people uh, acting in such viciousness towards each other, Lord. And we pray for our present generation that we would know you, that we would repent of our wicked ways, that you would bring revival on us, Lord, and, uh, and that uh, we would cry out to you, um, once and for all for our own sinfulness and ask for forgiveness. May it be so, Lord, in our homes. May our homes be filled with your peace and your presence. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so that final slide is Judges chapter 3, verse 12 to 4, 24. Not, not so big a text. I will see you next week. Have a God week.